The GI bleed lecture is going to be a long one. I'm going to start off first with an advanced organizer and approach to GI bleed and the symptoms that can help you decipher upper versus lower. Go through a quick algorithm of how you work up GI bleed and spend the back half of the lecture going over the individual diseases you need to know about. Let's start off with that advanced organizer. Esophagus, stomach, duodenum, and somewhere pretty early on, the ligament of trites. And the ligament of trites is what separates the upper GI bleed from the lower GI bleed. Now it makes sense that if you have bleeding, Near the inhole, blood can come out of the inhole. That is to say, hematemesis is a sign of an upper GI bleed. After all, the ligament of trites is very close to the opening that is the os the hematemesis. Blood per os makes sense that this be an upper GI bleed. In the very same way, most lower GI bleeds come from the colon. And so bright red blood per rectum, that is hematochesia, is a sign of lower GI bleed. But that isn't always true because blood is a cathartic agent. That means that a brisk bleed, that's an upper source, could present with hematochesia. Now obviously the presentation is going to be very different. The upper GI bleed with hematochesia has lost a lot of blood very quickly. They look very ill. Whereas a lower GI bleed presenting with hematochesia may not have lost that much blood and can be quite more stable. In the same way, if the bleed started here and took a long time to get down to the colon, that is to say that blood got digested along the way, you would think of an upper GI bleed. And so melana is usually indicative of an upper GI bleed. But we've only talked about the duodenum and the colon. There's a lot of other stuff in here. Anything south of the ligament of trites is considered a lower GI bleed. So if that bleeding source were higher in the intestines, there could still be melana and considered a lower GI bleed. The point of this is that you can't use the history to really separate out upper from lower GI bleed, except in the setting of hematemesis where you know it must be an upper GI bleed source. Hematochesia is generally lower GI bleed, but can be upper. Melana is generally an upper GI bleed, but can be lower. Don't get confused. And I'm going to put up here a couple of the etiologies of GI bleed. This is not an all-encompassing list, but it's the things I want to highlight so that you know what to look for most commonly. The first is going to be epistaxis. If you swallow blood, it might come out the other side looking dark, like melana, even though there's no GI bleed. The most common cause of an upper GI bleed is going to be peptic ulcer disease in the non-serotic and varices in the serotic. But still, you need to give consideration for things like GERD and cancer. One particular thing that comes up on the test, but not very often in real life, is a Dulafoy's lesion, a normal anatomic variant. And then AVMs can exist anywhere. For lower GI bleeds, the most common are going to be diverticular hemorrhage and hemorrhoids. But don't forget about cancer, and AVMs can be anywhere. All right, so if you have all these potential diseases, how do you figure out which one it is if you can't use the history to your advantage? Well, if someone comes in with the signs and symptoms of a GI bleed, you're going to do the same thing in the same order, regardless if you think it's upper or lower. The first thing is going to be stabilize. What is stabilization? 
You're going to do the same five things to every patient, every time, regardless of the GI bleed. That is, get two large bore IVs. AC or higher, 18 gauge or larger. The reason why you do this is because the rate of transfusion is limited by the length of the catheter, as well as the diameter. The length more so. It is better to have short, stubby peripheral lines than it is to have central venous access with a triple lumen catheter. You want short, stubby lines, and you want a lot of them so you can slam blood and blood product in if you need to. You give intravenous fluids, intravenous PPI, type and cross, transfuse as needed, and call GI. If they are serotic, you're going to give octreotide. Octreotide reduces portal pressures in variceal hemorrhage and ceftriaxone, which prophylaxes against SPP. Check out the cirrhosis complication lecture that precedes this one. But every patient, every time, gets two large bore IVs, intravenous fluids, IV PPI, type and cross, and call GI. Indeed, an intravenous proton pump inhibitor does nothing for a lower GI bleed, but it doesn't hurt it. And it does do something for an upper GI bleed, like peptic ulcer disease. You give intravenous fluids to support hemodynamics, and you transfuse blood as needed, knowing that the hemoglobin you get during an acute hemorrhage does not reflect blood loss. If you get a hemoglobin during hemorrhage, it will be normal. If you get one after volume resuscitation, you reveal the true hemoglobin. So if they have signs and symptoms of a GI bleed, stabilize them. Why do you call GI? What does that mean? Call GI means do the following things. And this is what we're gonna talk about next. The workup of someone who's having a GI bleed. The first thing used to be an NG tube with lavage. What you do is put an NG tube down someone, inject a bunch of water and suck it back out. And the way it worked was if there's blood mixed in with what you aspirate, then you know it's an upper GI bleed. If you don't, then it's probably not an upper GI bleed. It turns out that 30% of upper GI bleeding sources have negative gastric lavages. So this is not the right answer. Some GI people say don't even do it anymore. It can still be done because it has prognostic information. If you do a lavage and you pull back on the clots, you know that the bleeding has stopped. If you lavage someone and it's all blood and you lavage again and it's all blood, you know that the ongoing bleeding is brisk and they may need an intervention sooner. But this is no longer the diagnostic step. Instead, regardless of what the NGT lavage shows, you go to an EGD. And if you find the bleeding source on endoscopy, it was an upper GI bleed, and you can take interventions with the endoscopy. I'll talk about what those are when we talk about the individual diseases. If it's negative, then you presume this is a lower GI bleed. And then you have to decide what to do next. And how you decide is based on the rate of bleed. Now you can assign numbers to these, but what I want you to feel is really fast, stopped, and still going. If it has stopped altogether, then you do a colonoscopy. Let's talk about why you have to wait for it to stop to do a colonoscopy. Why can't you do colonoscopy all the time? Well, it makes sense that if you're doing an endoscopy and the bleeding source is bleeding down the GI tract, if you do a scope, you'll see nothing, 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 then the source of bleed and a bunch of blood disappearing. So endoscopy from the upper side works. But if the bleed is starting in the colon and it's leaving out towards the rectum and the camera is coming in from the rectum, all it's going to encounter is blood, 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 and you, all you see is a river of blood. The bleeding must have stopped so you can use the colonoscopy. If the bleeding is very brisk, and this is the person who's going to need constant transfusions, you're standing at the bedside giving blood product, this person needs an arteriogram. Because not only does the arteriogram allow you to visualize the bleed, it also allows you to embolize. That is cut off the source of bleeding, both diagnostic and therapeutic. And then if it's ongoing but not brisk, 
you can use a tagged red blood cell scan. But if you don't find the source of bleed, right, you do two scopes, endoscopy, double push enteroscopy, trying to get a little bit deeper into the intestines. You've done the colonoscopy. You haven't found the source of bleed, but they're still bleeding. That is the time that you can do the pill cam endoscopy. Where you literally swallow a pill, that's a camera. It takes pictures as it goes. You poop out the camera, and all the while it's been transmitting data, and they find the source of bleed that way. This first half of the lecture was just going to be the approach to GI bleed and the potential diagnoses there are, and the diagnostic workup of someone who's having a GI bleed, including stabilization. In the back half of this lecture, we're going to talk about the etiologies of GI bleed. This is going to be a very high-level discussion, and as you watch the rest of the GI series, you may encounter these diseases in more detail. I want to talk to you about them here so we can include a high-yield review of what you should think of when you see GI bleed. We're going to start with the most dangerous, and that is esophageal varices. We talk about this in the cirrhosis complications lecture. This is a product of portal hypertension, generally from cirrhosis. The patient will be a cirrhotic and present with a GI bleed. The diagnosis is made with endoscopy, and the treatment is multifold. The first thing you're going to do is give up triotide. This reduces the portal pressures. You can temporize until a scope can be done with a Blakemore tube. That is, you inflate a balloon in the esophagus and literally tamponade the vessels so that it doesn't bleed, but that's not a long-term solution. The best way to intervene is with banding on endoscopy. But even that is temporizing because the bands fall off and they may re-bleed. Ultimately, transplant is curative, but you may have to bridge with tips. With tips, you literally take a shunt from the portal vein to the vena cava. You bypass the liver, reducing portal pressures and reducing varices. But you bypass the liver, leading to worsening of hepatic encephalopathy. The benefit of this is only if they have variceal hemorrhage, which will kill them. Don't do a tips for any other reason except esophageal varices because you lead to hepatic encephalopathy. And you can prophylax these with beta blockers like propranolol or natalol. We have an entire lecture on peptic ulcer disease. The pathology that you should be considering is H. pylori, NSAIDs, and cancer. The patient will present with dyspepsia, and a GI bleed. The diagnosis is made on endoscopy. The treatment is going to be etiology specific, but everyone benefits from a PPI. The EGD with biopsy allows you to differentiate which of the ulcers it is. I do want to take time to compare the Mallory Weiss tear with Borhov syndrome because this, this discussion often comes up. We talk about it more in surgery. The Mallory Weiss tear is a superficial tear in the esophageal mucosa. And this is going to be in the patients who are their weekend warriors. These are not the people who vomit all the time. This is the person who goes out and parties too hard and then vomits and vomits and vomits blood and vomits blood and then just vomits. This is very important. Mallory Weiss is self-limiting. So if someone had a GI bleed and it got better on its own, it's probably the Mallory Weiss, especially if there were retching or vomiting involved. But if they are bleeding right there in front of you, you don't know that it's a Mallory Weiss tear. So you'll treat them just like any other GI bleed. You'll stabilize them and then do an endoscopy, which will reveal the Mallory Weiss. The treatment is supportive only. A PPI wouldn't hurt, but you don't have to give it. This is in stark contrast to the Borhov syndrome, or bin heaving syndrome. This will not present as a GI bleed, but they're often compared to each other. This is going to be a transmural tear in the esophagus. This is a hole in the esophagus into the chest. 
the patient is going to be someone who vomits and retches often. This is the career vomiter. So you want to look for the alcoholic or the bulimic with binges and purges. And because air in the mediastinum, in the chest, isn't good, the person is going to be sick as shit. They're going to be febrile, dysnic, and have evidence of air in the mediastinum. Air in the mediastinum can be seen on chest x-ray or heard on the physical exam. What you're looking for is subcutaneous air, Rice Krispies under the skin, the ham and crunch with each heartbeat, the air around the pericardium, you can actually hear it, or an air in the mediastinum on chest x-ray. The diagnosis is made ultimately with an endoscopy. The best test is an EGD, but you will not start there. The reason is if you just blindly insert a scope and you actually take the path of least resistance, you end up with a camera in the chest. Not useful. In fact, worse. The first test is gastrographin. Then barium. Gastrographin is irritating to the lungs. So if aspirated, it doesn't do very well. But gastrographin is water soluble. So if it gets into the mediastinum, it's less irritating than barium is to the mediastinum. You do a gastrographin swallow. If that's normal, do a barium swallow. If that's normal, you do an EGD. But if at any point you find perforation, diagnosis is done, and the treatment is surgery. Last one of the upper GI bleeds I really want you to know about is Dulafoy's lesion. This is a normal anatomic variant. And it just happens to be an artery that's very close to the mucosal surface. And for whatever reason, small erosions get into it and it starts to spurt. And it can be a brisk, painless bleed. It's actually quite hard to diagnose. It's diagnosed by endoscopy, which you actually have to see the lesion bleeding. And what can happen is that it could spontaneously resolve and then pop out again and resolve. So it may have to be on repeated endoscopy that you find it. And if you find it, cut it out. Moving down to the lower GI tract, the most common cause of a lower GI bleed is going to be diverticular hemorrhage and hemorrhoids. Let's talk about hemorrhoids first. We talk more about hemorrhoids in this general surgery lectures. There are two types of hemorrhoids, internal and external. Internal hemorrhoids bleed but do not hurt. External hemorrhoids hurt or itch, but do not bleed. What you're looking for is blood on the toilet paper or on the stool, but not mixed in. The idea is that the hemorrhoids must be at the very end of the GI tract. So that is, as the stool comes out, it doesn't get a chance to get mixed in with the stool. So if the blood is not mixed, it's probably hemorrhoids. The diagnosis is made with your fingers and your eyes. It's a clinical diagnosis. You don't need a scope to find these. And the treatment are going to be things like sitz baths, preparation H, and eventually you may get to hemorrhoidectomy. Being cautious not to remove the circumference of the rectum. We have a lecture on diverticular disease. The diverticular hemorrhage is particularly common. The pathology comes from an arteriole in the dome of a diverticula. And the patients who get diverticula are going to be those who are over 50 years old with Western diets. And the patient will present with a painless bright red blood per rectum. This is usually self-limiting, even though there's a high risk of re-bleed. The diagnosis is made once the bleeding stops by colonoscopy. You don't see the bleed, you see the diverticula. And the treatment would be resection of the diverticula, a hemicolectomy. And I want to talk about the difference between mesenteric ischemia 
and ischemic colitis. Mesenteric ischemia is basically coronary artery disease of the gut. It is a vascular disease in the gut. So it's essentially a gut attack. Very much in the same way that coronary artery disease causes a heart attack. The patient is going to be a vasculopath or have a reason for embolization, like AFib or recent angiography. And because the bowel is dying, it hurts. But the physical exam doesn't tell you that because nothing is inflamed yet, nothing has touched the peritoneum. So there's going to be pain out of proportion to the physical exam. Pain out of proportion to a physical exam and vasculopathy means mesenteric ischemia. And they may have been nice to you and given you the unstable angina. That is, when someone walks a certain distance, they get chest pain, coronary artery disease. When someone eats with mesenteric ischemia, chronic mesenteric ischemia, they get abdominal pain. So if there had been a history of pain with eating, and because they get pain with eating, they avoid eating and weight loss, now you start thinking about chronic mesenteric ischemia leading to the acute event. So chronic mesenteric ischemia is going to present with angina of the gut, that is pain with eating, whereas acute mesenteric ischemia is going to present with pain out of proportion in a vascular path, much like a heart attack. The diagnosis is made on angiogram. If you wait for there to be a bloody bowel movement, bowel has already died. You want to catch them before they have the bloody diarrhea. You can see it on colonoscopy, but in order to visualize dead tissue, the tissue has to have already died. So get the angiogram, and then your job is to either resect the dead tissue or somehow revascularize. This is very different from ischemic colitis. Ischemic colitis occurs at the watershed areas. That is, a patient gets hypotensive for another reason, and then they get a painful bright red blood per rectum. Painful because bowel is dying. Diagnosis is made with colonoscopy. But much in the same way as we just discussed, if you see dead tissue on colonoscopy, the tissue has already taken the hit, and the treatment is supportive. And lastly, one association I want you to have is AVMs with aortic stenosis. Don't worry about why or how. That's an association like a score some bonus points. First half of the video was the approach and the diagnostic workup. Back half was these diseases, the high yield ones with a very high level discussion what you must know for the test, knowing that you can find more details of each of these diseases in their corresponding lectures throughout this course. That's GI bleed.